This week, we've lost trans person number 12 to anti-trans violence. The show pose is must-see trans TV. What tennis rivalry? And in my closing commentary, the end and the beginning. This is Transgrio Weekly. I'm Monica Roberts, and here's the news. We have now lost our 12th person in 2018 to anti-trans violence. She is 38-year-old Antasha Devine Sherrington English. She was originally from Albany, Georgia, but resided in Jacksonville, Florida. English was found by police at 3.45 a.m. Eastern Time, suffering from a gunshot wound, lying between two houses during the early morning hours of June 1st at 1500 Ella Street. She was rushed to a nearby hospital, but died from the wound to her abdomen. English transitioned over 20 years ago and was a well-loved multiple title holder in the trans pageant world. She was also a featured entertainer at the Jacksonville Club called In Cahoots for nearly a decade. She is, in addition to being the 12th person we've lost to anti-trans violence, the sixth African-American trans person we've lost in 2018 and the second in the city of Jacksonville. English is also another trans person under 40 we've lost to this violence. Candlelight Vigil was held on June 7 for Antasha, in addition to a benefit show at In Cahoots to honor her and defray her funeral costs. The Jacksonville Sheriff's Office stated her death is an active murder investigation, and they are looking for any information or tips that will help solve this case. If you have any information that could be helpful, please call them at 904-630-0500 or email them at jsocrimetips at jackssheriff.org. To remain anonymous and be eligible for a cash reward of up to $3,000 for tips that lead to an arrest, contact Crime Stoppers at 1-866-845-TIPS. Here's hoping that the person who committed this crime will be expeditiously caught and punished for it. Rest in power and peace, Antasha. We will continue to say your name until justice is served in your case. I love a good scripted TV show, and especially one that has trans actors and themes in it. One show that is rapidly becoming a favorite for me is the FX series Pose. It's set in 1987 New York about the time when not only the ballroom culture was taking off, but boo hiss, so was the Trump Organization. Pose also features the largest ever cast of trans actors in a scripted television series. It also features Janet Mock as a producer, writer, and director, and Our Lady J as a scriptwriter. Pose focuses on the battle between the upstart House of Evangelista, founded by Blanca Rodriguez, a former member of the House of Abundance, run by the evil Electra Abundance. It features a storyline between Stan Bowes, a rising executive in a Trump organization who is falling for Angel Evangelista, a former member of the House of Abundance, and a sex worker who is a member of Blanca's House of Evangelista. There's also another storyline focused on Damon, a homeless teen and dancer who becomes Blanca's first recruit into the House of Evangelista. Damon is trying to juggle his dream of becoming a dancer with school and the ballroom communities. Focus, children. It is time we remind the world who we are. Jackpot. Mother, what do we take? Everything. The category is... Royalty! Someone as talented as you wind up dancing for a whole bunch of junkies. I want to be a star. You ever consider joining a house? What do you mean? Well, a house is a family you get to choose. I have bigger dreams of performing at some ball. I have nowhere else to go. Come in. Pose debuted on FX June 3rd to rave reviews from television critics and thumbs up commentary from people in the ballroom community. You can see for yourself how worthy this must-see trans TV show is on Sundays at 8 p.m. Central Time, followed by an encore of that week's episode, if you missed it. I've enjoyed the episodes I've gotten to watch so far, and I wouldn't be surprised at all to see it picked up for another season. 
I'm a huge tennis fan, and two of my favorite players are Venus and Serena Williams. When it's time for a Grand Slam tournament, I'm always looking forward to see how well the Williams siblings will do and how far they'll advance, or if we'll be blessed with another All-Williams final. During a recent French Open, unfortunately Venus was knocked out in the first round, but Serena was cruising until she injured the pec muscle on her serving arm. That forced her to withdraw from her fourth round match with Maria Sharapova of Russia. For some reason, the media and Maria Sharapova thinks there's a rivalry between her and Serena Williams that started after Sharapova upset her in the 2004 Wimbledon final and repeated the trick in the 2004 WTA championship. Sharapova's book Unstoppable also added fuel to the drama between the two women. Sharapova has also been positioned versus Serena's greatness as the Great White Hope. More like the Great White Nope. Since 2004, Serena has beaten Sharapova like she stole something over the last 14 years. She's 19-2 and two against Sharadopa, has won 18 straight matches against her, and the last seven matches they've played against each other, Sharadopa has lost to Williams in straight sets. I repeat. What rivalry? Sharapova is five inches taller and five years younger than Serena, but felt the need to take a banned substance in order to compete against a woman who won the 2017 Australian Open while she was several weeks pregnant and without dropping a set. Maria Sharapova isn't in Serena Williams' class, and I got receipts. 23 Grand Slam titles versus just five for Sharadopa four Olympic gold medals, and zero for Sharapova. And what's that all-time record again? 19 and two. So nah, don't even part your lips to spout that ridiculous notion that there is a competitive tennis rivalry between Serena Williams and Maria Sharapova. Serena has been showing up and showing out on the court with her A-plus greatest of all-time tennis acumen where it matters on the tennis court. The only thing Sharapova has been doing is bumping her gums and repeatedly losing to Serena Williams. Many of you have expressed how happy you are to see me and my production team take Transgrio into the video realm. This is now our 15th show and I've enjoyed bringing them to you along with my concept kit production team. But this 15th show will be sadly the last for this first season of Transgrio Weekly. As with all shows, it's time to go into summer hiatus. It's time for me and our crew to take a well-earned vacation, review what we did right during the first season, and work on what we can do to make this show even better. We also have some big ideas we want to implement in season two, such as doing interviews, looking at some stuff on the production end for next season, and as you probably guess, we're planning to do a video shut up fool of the year. How that video Shut Up Fool of the Year takes shape and when it happens is one of the things we'll discuss while the show is on hiatus. While this is the end of our run for season one of Transgrio Weekly, I would like to give thanks to you, the viewers and supporters. We end season one with 15 episodes instead of the original planned 10 episodes. What's next for Transgrio Weekly and when will season two start? You can find that out by continuing to follow us on social media, share the episodes from season one, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and like us on Facebook. Until then, have an enjoyable summer, and we'll see you when we get back.